You're listening to the Elephant in the Room Property Podcast, where the big things that never get talked about actually get talked about. I'm Veronica Morgan, real estate agent, buyer's agent and co-host of Fox Hills Location, Location, Location Australia. And I'm Chris Bates, financial planner, mortgage broker and wealth coach. And together, we're going to uncover who's really making the decisions when you buy a property. Please stick around for this week's Elephant Rider Bootcamp. And we have a cracking Dumbo of the Week coming up. Before we get started, everything we talk about on this podcast is general in nature and should never be considered to be personal financial advice. If you're looking to get advice, please seek the help of a licensed financial advisor or buyer's agent. They will tailor and document their advice to your personal circumstances. Now let's get cracking. We often find that money market professionals have scant regard for property as an investment class. There's often seems to be an either or mentality and today we're going to find out why this might be the case. And we're also going to talk about interest rates because pretty much everybody's expecting to see cuts to official rates this year. And what will this mean, not only to the property market, but in the macro sense, what does it say about the economy? In this episode, we pick the brains of Roger Montgomery, founder, chairman and chief investment officer of Montgomery Investment Management. He's a renowned value investor with more than 25 years experience. Roger is an awarded presenter on the subject of investing and appears regularly on the ABC as well as Your Money's Trading Day Live and 2GB Radio. I was on there a couple of weeks ago. There you go. Roger also writes regular commentary for major financial publications and newspapers, so he's a bit serious. Thank you so much for joining us today, Roger. Always a pleasure. Thank you, Roger. I um, just want to thank you just, I guess, secondly, is just for coming in and spending some time with you. I've read your stuff. I've read your book um, and uh, I really appreciate and value what you do. So thank you. Um, I guess for our listeners, you know, you're considered a value investor and a yep. lot of um, our listeners probably wouldn't understand the different types of share strategies, I guess. And, sure. You know, value versus growth or income and small cap and things like that. Can you please explain what is really a value investor and what's your philosophy regarding investing? Okay. So perhaps the way to structure the answer to that question is, is to um, ask a question. Um, what is any asset worth? What is its, whether it's a, a business or a block of land or a property or shares, what's it worth? Mm. What's the answer that most people give you to that question? And the answer is what, what someone else will give you for it. <laughs> what, it's actually not right. Um, that's the price. The price is what people will pay for something. Mm-hmm. But what something is intrinsically worth is very different. Yep. Uh, so take, for example, uh, that many, many years ago, back in the dot-com boom uh, of 2000 or 99, 2000, there was a company called NetJ.com. NetJ.com said in its prospectus it listed on the NASDAQ in the United States, the exchange over there, or the technology exchange over there. Uh, and they said in their prospectus, NetJ.com conducts no substantial business activity of any description. And NetJ.com has no plans of conducting any substantial business activity of any description for the foreseeable future. So it was a remarkably consistent business model. Yep. It, it wasn't doing anything. It never done anything and it wasn't going to do anything. Yep. Um, the, the interesting, I guess the interesting scenario that transpired was uh, you could buy the shares at 50 cents in pre-IPO, pre-initial public offering, uh, and then it listed at $2.00. And by March of 2000, it was trading at $8.88. Wow. It subsequently fell to zero and it went out of business and it ran out of money well, because no the managers, <laughs> it, ran out, it ran out of the money. It was, it was only worth the cash in the bank, um, but that was worth zero because it was being eroded by management fees. Yeah. And true to label, it, it conducted no substantial business activity of any description. Yeah. But here's the thing. Was it ever worth $8.88? No. No. Was someone prepared to pay $8.88? Yes. Mm. So the price is what people are prepared to pay, but value is what something is really worth. And our job as investors, and this is how I describe value investing, our job is simply to pay a lower price than what something is worth. Mm. And if and the great thing about the stock market, and perhaps less so in the property market, but I'm sure it's true in the property market as well, but in the stock market, because the, the, the asset is priced minute by minute, um, people overreact to influences that aren't related to the underlying business. So Trump says something, tweets something, the stock market goes down and the price of the reject shop falls, but reject shop's still selling the same amount of buckets today as it sold yesterday and mm. Maya's still doing what it was doing and Telstra's still selling as many plans on mobile phones as it was selling before. But the share price goes down because Trump tweeted something mm. about China. So 
So that's the that's what excites me about the stock market. People overreact and act irrationally, frequently, uh, and so you know if, <laughs> if property was priced minute by minute, you'd get people selling two betters because they think they're going down and they're going to buy three betters tomorrow. Yeah, you know, but but that doesn't happen. And in fact, the best way to invest in the stock market is to approach it the way you would property investing. Mm. To do it the same the same way. Yeah, I mean the whole dot com thing was a bit of an interesting, you know, like the pets companies. You know, if you research it, there's lots of companies. That just wasn't the only one that you we're know, in people, one right now, by the way. Yeah, with we're tech, in a, a tech bubble right now. Yeah, with the kind of the Amazons and the Apples of the world. No, they're making money. It's the ones that aren't making money. Hang that's on, really I Amazon interesting. Amazon wasn't. No, Amazon makes now billions making, of dollars, yeah. but it reinvests and expenses right, okay, that. Right. Right. Um, and so people often say Amazon doesn't make a profit. Mm. Well, actually, it makes. I think it made sixteen billion dollars mm. last year, right. but it just reinvested that in research and development and marketing. So mm. you, we talk about a tech bubble now. Tell us more about that then. Well, I, I really want to get onto property, but oh, I we will. Know, t- we will. Yeah, yeah. I'm curious about um, this one. <laughs> so, so you're seeing you're seeing uh, a couple of things happen. Um, number one, you're seeing really ridiculous multiples being paid for businesses that promise growth, mm. and because interest rates are really low, and we'll get back to interest rates again um, in Australia later on. Um, Because interest rates have been cut to zero in the United States since the GFC, and they've been falling for 37 years, then people have constantly been wanting to find other things to invest in. Mm -hmm. Back in the recession we had to have, you might remember in the the early 90s, 91, um, uh, cash was king and it was all about having cash. And what's happened is interest rates have gone down, cash becomes a liability, you don't want the cash anymore, Mm -hmm. you want to get rid of it. And so what we've seen is record prices achieved in art all around the world. You know, the highest price ever paid for a painting was last year. <laughs> Collectible cars. Yep. The highest price ever paid for any car was last year. Um, Ralph Lauren was offered 110 million US dollars for one of his cars and he knocked it back. Um, uh, record prices for low digit number plates, record mm. prices for wine, you name it. Record mm. prices for property uh, last year and the year before. You know, we've seen that. Uh, and that's a function of cheaper interest rates. It's not because anyone's a genius at investing. It's these things have gone up. They've gone up because interest rates have gone down. So if everyone remembers that interest rates act like gravity on asset valuations through something called the present value formula, you can look that up. I won't go mm. trying to explain arithmetic. Yeah, on, yeah. On, on a podcast. You know, on a podcast. <laughs> got no whiteboard, yeah. I'm having a good crack at it on my own <laughs> podcast, but it's not easy. Um, uh, and so, so interest rates go down. The present value of future cash flows is higher. So mm. if I gave you $10 in 10 years' time, that would be worth more today at a lower interest rate than if the interest rate was high Mm -hmm. because I can invest that cash and at a low interest rate, I don't have to invest, I can invest a lot more at a low interest rate Mm -hmm. to get the $10 in the future, Mm -hmm. where if interest rates are high, I can invest a lot lower amount of money Mm -hmm. and I'll get $10 in the future. Mm -hmm. So that's true for property Mm. and people have to remember that. That's Mm. the big influence. Um, And credit availability, which we'll come to later, also affects property. Um, because if it's easier to borrow money uh, for anything, people do it. Now, back to your tech question or the tech mm. bubble. A lot of the cash has flown flowed into private equity. Yep. And in fact, if you look at the number of private equity firms that have that existed 10 years ago and the number today, it's an exponential curve that links the two numbers. Yep. So it's a bit like real estate agents in Australia. You know, the, prop, the population of Australia grows at about 1.3% per annum. Uh, over the last decade, and the population of real estate agents in Australia has grown at about 9% per annum. You know, we don't need 9% more real estate agents mm. every year to serve a population that isn't growing very it's fast. It's falling again now, though. So it will be. <laughs> yeah. And wherever you see that, wherever you see a, um, a proliferation of a particular profession, mm. uh, you know, very quickly expanding, you know that there's something going on that isn't quite natural yep. uh, and it isn't sustainable. Uh, and so in private equity land, that's what we've seen. So people have said, you know what? I don't want cash. Uh, I'm going to give it to these private equity investors. Mm-hmm. They've now got $1.7 trillion of uncalled capital. And uncalled capital, the, I won't go into it in too much detail, but but what you do is you pledge money to private equity and then they draw down on it from you. Mm-hmm. And so there's all this money. What do you do with it? Yep. I mean, what do you do if you're a young private equity manager and you've just been given $1.7 trillion, you go and buy stuff. Yeah, Otherwise, you have to give the money back. So you go and buy stuff. So you make investments. And what's hot, mm. stuff that's hot right now is software. <clears throat> uh, and uh, and there was an article back in 2011 uh, written by a guy named Mark Andreessen. 
He is one of the founding investors in Facebook, in LinkedIn, Twitter, mm. Instagram, you know, you name it. He's been there. He wrote an article in 2011 entitled, for the Wall Street Journal, entitled, Why Software is Going to Eat the World. Uh, and that was the legitimate reason for buying software companies, mm. or what we call SaaS companies, software as a service companies. But what the smart money does at the start, the dumb money does at the end. Mm. And right now, a lot of dumb money has been flowing into these companies and Uber is probably the poster yep. child. That business exists because it doesn't charge enough for its service. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't make an economic return to its shareholders. It doesn't make a, re a return on the investment that it's made. It's raised $24.7 billion since it started 10 years ago mm. and it's only got 2% penetration in the markets where it exists. It said in its prospectus that, you know, it had a something like a $16 trillion uh, total addressable market, but that would be about 20% of global GDP. Mm. It's never going to be 20% of the globe. <laughs> um, we would rename Earth Uber yeah. if that was the case. <laughs> so, so people have got really excited about, you know, um, ride hailing services but it doesn't make money. It loses money. Mm. And with the $24 billion it's been given, which by the way, was 2000% more money, 20 times more money than was given to Amazon before it listed. Mm. Um, and it, it doesn't make a profit. And so people are getting excited about technology transforming the world. They always do. But do you mm. know who wins? The consumer wins. Mm. So Lower prices. Yeah, and 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 so consumer consumers win from these services. You take the car for example. If you'd been around in the late eighteen hundred when Carl Benz drove the first horseless carriage, mm. you might have got really excited about how this could transform the world. In fact, it wasn't Carl that invented um, transport, motorized transport. It was his wife Berta. Mm -hmm. She stole the car and actually drove it to another town, and then stopped in at a pharmacy and fueled it up with alcohol and um, with medicine. And went to another town. Then when she got back, they realised they were onto something pretty exciting. Now imagine you'd been there. Imagine you'd actually been there. She took the kids too. Wow. Um, imagine you'd been there. You would have thought, gosh, this is going to, I'm going to invest in this. Mm. From that date, there has been 1,500 car manufacturers in the United States. Uh, none of them exist today and still make a profit. And the ones that do make a profit, that do exist, were bailed out by the mm. private equity or the government. So consumers have won. The world was transformed by that technology, but investors didn't win. Yeah. And that's why we're a little bit nervous about the prices we're seeing paid for these businesses. People have lost touch with reality uh, and that it'll, it's hard to pick the winner. Um, none of, no one's making any money out of mm. any of these companies um, other than the share price going up. And that's that's winning from speculating, not winning from investing. Mm, big well, it's, distinction. Well, it's funny so it's you a, say that because the all the um, – you know, yeah, last year with Bitcoin, right, the whole greater fool theory, you know, Correct. sometimes people believe that, you know, if society is believing or kind of drinking the, the Kool-Aid, I guess you could invest in Uber knowing that, or like you did with Facebook and other kind of tech companies, knowing that some idiot, I guess, is going to pay more for it in the future. So yeah. you kind of can, that is an investment strategy that some people do employ, but it's not really something built on found. You always got the risk of it getting found out, well, I guess. Well, it's speculating. Yeah. So you're yeah. betting on someone paying more and that happens a lot in property. Exactly. Mm, you know, it does. You know, when, when the yields on property get to a level that are ridiculously low, um, you're going to make a negative return, which is what negative gearing is, right? I describe it as a way to lose fifty, lose a dollar to make 50 cents. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> and that's what negative gearing is, right? So, so people are willing to lose money on the income side of the equation in the hope that they'll make money on the capital. Mm. And the only way they're going to make money on the capital side is if someone's willing to pay more and yield less, mm. Mm. get an even lower return from the income from that property. Unless of course they have development experience or, you know, there's an ability to strata the property and, and so on. So, so we, we're seeing that in the technology space at the moment where yep. there's a disengagement um, between reality and hope. Mm. Uh, and we can see, we, we know the private equity guys know it too, mm. because they are lining up. There's a, a, a larger number of unicorns being floated this year than ever before. And 83% of them last year 
were unprofitable and 90% so far this year are unprofitable. Mm. So they're trying to get out. Yeah. They're trying to liquidate. The problem is that they won't be able to get as much money. And we saw that with Uber. Uber last year, was, was it was being suggested that it would float at $120 billion valuation. It came on at $75 billion. Yep. Um, still a, a ridiculous amount of money. And so now the private equity guys are going, hey, the tap's being turned off. And the reason the tap's being turned off is the wealthy investors that would normally invest in these companies when they come to float, mm. they all piled in at the private equity end of the equation. They're already investors in these businesses. Yeah. They're now trying to get out. Who are they going to sell to? Mums and dads. Yeah. Yeah. And the mums and dads are losing their appetite. In fact, they lost money on average last year buying new floats. And that'll eventually provide what we call a negative feedback loop. Uh, and that'll get worse. And to index funds as well? Because they have well, to buy? Well, indexes, are, they're forced to buy some of these companies yeah. depending on their weighting. Yeah. yeah, and so I guess that's probably one of the risks for index funds. Just generally, I think a lot of people have gone to index funds. A lot of listeners, a lot of younger people, you know, have been kind of told that that's the better option. It's a way of being active, you know, lower yeah. fees. But the reality is there's risk with index investing, and, and I don't well, think it's factored in a lot of the time. Well, value investing has has really failed over the last sort of five or six years because the winners have been people who've backed the loss-making companies, mm. the ones that are going to change the world, uh, but time and time again throughout history, um, we see bubbles form and they bust. Mm. Uh, and when they bust, people will realise our oh, value investing was really quite sensible. It looks stupid now because it doesn't work. Um, the best thing to do is just to buy the things going up the most mm. uh, or buy the things that don't make money. But it does come back to that idea of, you know, understanding the difference between speculation and investing. Correct. And also this idea of you're buying an asset. And so what is that asset? What is that asset worth, yeah. as you're saying, versus you, what are you paying for it? Um Look, You've hit I'll, the nail on the head. That's exactly right. Uh, you know, that's that's all it comes down to. Mm. So, so you either treat the stock market as a place where you bet on things going up and down, mm. or you treat the stock market as a place where you can buy a piece of a business. And if you you approach it the latter, you might not you might miss out on some of the exciting runs that we've seen in the last year and a half. But in the long run, you'll do a lot better. <laughs> and I think in property, it's exactly the same. You know, you can either come and bet on a mining town or a rural and, and on some type of new development or infrastructure, or it may go up and may go down, but, or you could just go buy a real scarce asset in the inner ring where they're not building anymore. It's not mm. sexy, but you're not going to get amazing returns in, you know, short spaces. But when you come back in, you know, 30, 40 years time, it's still a scarce asset. Population's more. Population will be double yeah. in 40 years. Let they always underestimate the, you know, the rate of population growth mm. in Australia. Uh, and uh, you've got to remember that, you know, there, if you've got a, a young audience, then, you know, people don't think when they're young, they're going to be 40 years of age mm. or 50 years of I age, sure as hell <clears didn't>. <laughs> <laughs> but you get there a lot faster than you think. Yeah. You know, and you sort of look back and you wish you'd made some really mm. sensible long-term investments back then. And I think, you know, in the next six months, the opportunity to do just that at cheaper prices, you know, <clears throat> I think that window will close. Mm. Uh, and so now's the time to get serious. Yeah, but it's interesting because everybody, we're all sheep, you know, we're sitting in our hands and we're waiting for the bottom of the market. Oh, uh, well, and you know, I if you wait for that. the bottom, the liquidity dries up and you miss out on buying because there's nothing available. That's that exactly want. what's happening we're right now. We're seeing that, yeah. yeah. Mm. Well, I'm not a property <laughs> investor, but I just yeah. know that's how liquidity well, it's works. Hu it's yeah. human behaviour. That's what it is. It drives yeah. it, isn't it? Well, oh, I'm not going to get my price, so therefore I'm not going to list my property. Yes. So if you don't list your property, you can't be bought mm. by those people trying to buy mm. at the bottom. So. I, I will say I think I got really lucky. We just bought um, a magnificent house in Pimble on almost an acre. Um, <clears throat> it's an old, very old house. It's over 115 years old. Mm. Um, but we bought it the weekend before the election. <laughs> uh, mm. and, and, I, and I know because I've brought some architects in to quote on rebuilding the property, I bought the house and land for less than it would cost to replace the house, mm. uh, which, uh, and now the, you know, now the coalition has won. Yep. Now we're going to be selling our other house. So I look like a genius, but it was complete luck or divine oh. intervention. You've ridden that way no. perfectly. <laughs> no, you? I literally had a coffee with a client just before here today in the same story. I mean, he just yeah. bought a house in Redfern on, on a good street in Redfern. I can't say where it is, but yeah. he bought just before the election and um, he was upgrading. So he's got another house to sell in Redfern. And uh, he's going to sell it after the election. So it's kind of, he's going to win on yeah. both hands. It's yeah. which funny, is, actually, um, the whole yeah. election thing, because I know with the whole negative gearing, ALP's negative gearing policy that we were banging on about for a long time, and we all thought, everyone thought. It's anti-investor, that it, policy. Very it was much very so. anti-investor. Yeah. 
and very poorly. Well, anyway, let's not get into that because it's not happening. But the the funny thing is that I gave a lot of talks on this, and every time I'd say, "So put your hand up if you think the coalition's going to win the election." Not one hand ever put yeah. up. Yeah. There was a one that almost went up and says, "I don't think they are, but I hope they are." That was just that was the closest I got to a hand yes. going up. Yeah. And so we all had this expectation. And so I know myself, I said, right, if they get in, then we're, we're going to see a spike in prices yeah. before the end of the year. Mm. Yeah, because people are sheep. That's what's mm. going to happen. So instead, we've had a surprise, a surprise result. And now we're potentially going to see an increase in prices purely because of consumer sentiment. It's what we call a relief rally in our industry. Relief rally. A relief right. rally. A, a, a relief that something bad that everyone thought was going to happen didn't happen. Yeah. Uh, and so everyone scrambles to reposition themselves mm. um, because it, 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 they have to reappraise the future. Um, just remember there's an election every three years. I know. When you're, investing in, <laughs> when you're investing in property and when you're investing in shares, your horizon is much longer than three years. Yes. Yep. So I think a lot, of, a lot of forests have been felled to write about the Australian election and, and really mm. – yeah, there'll be another one in, in 36 months. So big change though. And, you know, so there's a relief rally right now, but then there's, you know, macro kind of global yeah. pressures, which is kind of we forget about mm. here in Australia because mm. it's a little island. Um, you know, there's big picture things happening all over the world. Sure. What's your view on kind of just some of these things that are playing out and how the Australian government might be wanting to play them and okay. what so options they've got? One of the biggest trends that, that has influenced, there's a, there's a couple of things. There's, there's, there's liquidity or credit availability, which we'll get to. Interest rates is another one. And, and, and related to, I guess, both of those things is, is you know, buyer demand. Um, <clears throat> so a big influence, excuse me. <clears throat> a, you, you can just re-record yeah, over that's that. Stress. <clears throat> Thanks. So a big, uh, yeah, a, a really prominent trend that emerged after the GFC was the advent of the Chinese buyer, mm -hmm. uh, and that and that influenced prices from you know Queenstown to Vancouver, Toronto, Hong Kong, Singapore, New York, London, Sydney, and Melbourne, uh, and even Perth. What's happened though is uh, the the Chinese government has changed or restricted the amount of money that can be taken out of China. So remember, I talked about credit availability or finance availability, and so. A lot of them, a lot of the Chinese were able to take out the money for the deposit. And then what the Chinese government did is essentially they restricted, um, restricted the amount of outflows of foreign exchange outflows to $50,000 per family per year. Consequently, no one can satisfy the, uh, the, their obligation to settle on the properties that they bought. Uh, and so we've seen the Foreign Investment Review Board uh, applications for new and established housing fall from about $75 billion in 2015-16 to about $11 billion today. Mm. So that is a massive plunge, you know, almost a 90% plunge in applications to buy property from Chinese investors mm -hmm. in Australia. And that takes out a huge proportion of the market in Australia. So that's one influence. The other one is interest rates. And just while we're there on the Chinese, I think it's an it interesting thing. Of that $70 billion, a lot of that would have went into new property and that, yes. and that money is there to support our construction industry, I guess. Yep. And so whilst we've got a $7 trillion property market or $6.5 trillion maybe now, Jeez, it's maybe only a small part of it, $60, 60 billion, but that $60 billion is going funneled mainly to our construction industry, isn't it? Yeah. What, what you have to remember though, and this is something that a lot of people forget, is not it's not you and I, if we're not buying or selling this weekend, we don't influence house prices. Mm. It's what we call in our industry, the marginal buyer and the mm. marginal seller. They'll determine prices for everyone else. Yep. And so it's what people do this weekend. So if last weekend there were 50 Chinese buyers for, a, you know, a, an upper North shore house on a 900 square meter block mm. and this weekend there are none, well, that's going to affect what the marginal price is yep. and therefore affect prices for everybody else. And that's been happening globally. So we've seen in London and all the cities that I listed earlier, we've seen prices fall, yep. um, not just in Australia. So it's a global phenomena. It's got nothing to do with population growth. You know, I, I, I can't tell you how many times when I argued in 2016 and 17 that property prices were going to fall, I can't tell you how many people, by the way, people get really angry. Yes. Don't they? They seem to, and I don't understand why they don't play the ball and they play the player. And they were telling me, Rog, what you don't understand 
is population growth. Mm. And I tried to remind people that since Captain Cook put that flag in the ground in Botany Bay, the population of Australia has been growing. Mm. And yet we haven't been immune to periods where prices have fallen. Yeah. And all around the world, the population has been growing. You know, we, we were 3 billion when I was a kid and we're heading for 9 billion. Yeah. Uh, and yet markets for property fall yeah. despite population growth. It's so because it's one of the levers. Yeah, well, the two, big, <laughs> the, the two biggest by far are going to be, and in the background, the population is always growing, but mm. the two levers are always going to be credit availability and interest rates. Absolutely. And what happened in Australia, and the reason why property was going to fall, was because after David Murray's financial system inquiry in 2014 or 15, um, he basically... The, as a consequence of that um, financial system inquiry and the, and the requirement to make the banks unquestionably strong, um, APRA imposed a couple of restrictions on mm. the banks. Number one, uh, investor loan growth was limited to 10%. And number two, interest-only mortgages couldn't be more than 30% of all mortgages written. Yep. And that completely changed the dynamic for credit availability. And it wasn't the Royal Commission. That was just the icing on the cake or the yeah. final nail in the coffin um, and that really, the banks overreacted arguably on that. And so they're now loosening the screws, yeah. uh, which is going to be good um, for property prices. Uh, but yeah, after the financial system inquiry, that's when it really became mm. tougher for banks to lend. But of course, people were lying about what they were, uh, what incomes they were earning and what expenses they had. And consequently, the banks kept lending, but then the Royal Commission came out and that stopped it in its tracks. And so now that we're at this point where a lot of good things have happened in the last couple of weeks. You yep. know, APRA have dropped their assessment rate, Correct. even an election win, yep. um, talk of an interest rate cut, even that's good, you know, um, I guess, and SCOMO is 5%. I mean, these are all but the things can that- Can we just, when you say good, right, because I think we have to be yeah. careful here. I think the pendulum was at one extreme, which was yes. where money was far too that's easy right. to get. And that's actually bad for the property market because it, well, it's it makes- it's bad for new buyers. Yeah. Because they're it, paying higher prices. Yeah. Right. And it's, it was bad for everyone though, because in reality, the whole market is overinflated then because it's basically, it's popped up by the fact, exactly. Yeah. So therefore we all want a stable property market. So therefore, you know, the pendulum's gone far the other way. So when we talk good, I think it's good because things are hopefully coming, the pendulum hopefully is coming towards the middle. And that is good for all of us. So then we've got activity within the market without being overinflated and unsustainable. Indeed. Well, you think about it this way, you put money in the bank you earn two, at the moment, about two and a half percent on a term deposit yeah. for 60 days. No risk of capital loss. You buy a property at an inflated price, you get a yield of one or two percent and the risk of capital loss. Mm. So on a risk, what we call in our industry, on a risk adjusted basis, that makes no sense. Mm. Yeah. And the only reason you would do that is if you thought you were going to be a gun speculator and someone else is going to pay more later. Well, no, you only do that because you don't know. You know, mums and dads, investors, and I hate to oh, say I see. it, that's but, you a know, point. unsophisticated yeah, that's a investors just don't know any better. They yeah. don't realise that there's risk in property. Yes. And, and you know, this is fertile ground for spec uh, for uh, spruikers as well, mm. feeding into that idea, well, look, just for the price of a cup of coffee, you too can be a property investor and yeah. you, your future will be secure. Yes. It's actually a lie in many, in more cases than not, I would well, say. Well, it's a lack of understanding, as you point mm. out, it's a, a lack of understanding of, you know, the basic metrics of investing. Um, the lower the price you pay, the higher your return. The higher the price you pay, the lower your return. It's, yeah. it's really that simple. But there's two simple. different returns here. You know, you're talking about yield as in as in. So I'm talking return. about total return. Or total yeah. return. Total return. Yeah. You know, if you buy something at a cheap price, you get the, a great yield and other people want that great yield. Mm. And guess so what? They'll be willing to pay more for the property. It, it, it's it finds its sensible. own level, doesn't it? But the yeah. problem is when you say like the lower the price, that sort of makes people potentially think, oh, well, I need to buy a cheap property and I'll get no, a better No, no, you need to buy you need to buy good value. That's price exactly, and, back to value. which is what I was talking yeah. about earlier. That's mm. the difference between price and value. Yep. It's like what you're saying just there is in our industry that would be someone saying I'm going to buy a 1 cent stock mm. because that's yes. cheap. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well actually it's going to go to 1/100th one one of a cent shortly, mm. you know, and you'll lose 90% of your money. Yeah. Uh, or 99% of your money. So it's not the it's not the cheapness, it's the value yep. that's yep. important. And yeah. short termism, how does that kind of play into the markets, I guess, you know, so, you know, when, when markets are booming, you know, people think, well, property market went up 15% last year, I should get in. Now it's going the other way. People don't want to get in. I guess it, you know, how does so kind of that play into boom and bust cycles? Three phases of a boom. So phase number one, a legitimate reason for rising prices to it, for growth to be expected. 
So that's probably the best way to say it, a legitimate reason for growth to be expected. So in the case of that Mark Andreessen article, you know, software was going to transform e-commerce, software was going to transform the, you know, going changing revenue models for mm. businesses, going from a, you know, a transaction base to a subscription base, uh, you know, you get recurring income streams. So there was a legitimate basis for the boom. And then what happens is additional money starts flowing and access to that particular theme increases through different structures. For example, it might be, you know, pooled investment vehicles in property. You know, you can buy industrial property together yep. in a syndicate. And 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 you see, you mentioned spruikers earlier, but I don't mean that in a negative sense, but you get people spruiking pooled investment vehicles. Yep. Uh, and so that gives access to more people. Then what happens in the third phase, though, is that that second phase feeds on the theme and it pushes prices up mm. and they're not necessarily extreme. But in the third phase, what happens is people remove all sense or all what's removed from the picture of relevance is, you know, the income from the property, enjoyment of its use, even its long run worth. Those things are no longer worried about or cared mm -hmm. about. All that matters is that the price will go up next month and next week because it went up last month and last week. Yep. And when you get to that point where people just need to buy because they fear missing out, mm. then that's when you're at towards the end of the boom and alter, arguably in a bubble. Now, you never can identify, people often say, well, there'll be a catalyst for it falling. There'll be a, you know, you'll see a reason that it'll decline. Often that's only evident after. Mm. Mm, now, yes. you know, it takes, you know, I, I, you know, I like to say that I got the property market right and I got the iron ore market right a few years ago, mm. but I don't get it all right. And mm. I think I'm lucky when I get it right. Uh, I don't think it's because <laughs> of genius on my part. It's mm. just happenstance. I love you, that. We've got a full or forecaster report and we, we brought out our inaugural one this year. So any listeners, you can download it on the website, theelephantintheroom.com.au. And it's all about that. You'll get it right sometimes. It's really Yeah, but it doesn't mean forecast. you're a genius. No. You know, you, <laughs> is it luck or is you know, it skill? They, well, you know, I, was, <laughs> I, I always remember the quote, you know, if you, if you want to forecast successfully – Forecast often. Mm. Yes. <laughs> and forget about them. <laughs> and forget about the ones it's you got wrong. It's a numbers game. Right. <laughs> you know, so no, in all seriousness, that's why we, we anchor our, or everything we say we anchor on on value. Uh, and then you can see, if you mm -hmm. if you know what something is worth, you can see when people are paying too much. Mm, yeah. Yeah, and people know it intrinsically. You know, they go to an auction for a property and they go, oh, it wasn't worth that. Mm. You know, and, mm. and you know deep down, you know, and you might, you might think you're wrong because the price went up mm. the following week or they sold it for a profit. Yeah. But that just means the person who bought it was even a bigger idiot. Mm. Um, and, you know, look, there there are dynamics dynamics in individual suburbs. So it's really yep. like individual stocks. You know, I can talk about the stock market being mm. overvalued, yep. but there'll always be things that are cheap. Mm. And it's the same thing in property. The property market a year ago or two years ago was way over the top. Mm -hmm. But you would have, if you looked hard enough, and you found opportunities and you were working diligently, you would have found things to buy that are cheap. Mm -hmm. And over the last couple of years, you would have still made money. I've got a good friend of mine who writes for the Fin Review, a guy named Chris Joy. Yep. He is a brilliant property investor, absolutely brilliant. Mm. And in the last two years, when property generally has been going down, he's made money in property. Mm. Uh, and so if you're smart and you, you do the due diligence and you know the due diligence to do better than I do in property, mm. um, you know, you can still make money. It's very true. In fact, I've done quite a few case studies on particularly like 2003 to 2007, for instance, case studies on two properties, similar price, same suburb, one went up, one went down. Why? Yeah. You know, and, and I'm Those actually- Those case studies are really useful. And because, mm. yeah, exactly. They proved the point. And, and the thing is, I'm actually collecting some data at the moment for properties that had sold in 2016 and then on sold in either 2018 or 2019. Some went up, some went down. Mm. Very similar suburbs as well. And so really digging into to see not everything goes up, see yep. not everything goes down. And, um, you know, I think that that's a debate that's often missing or a conversation that's often missing. And I think the same in the share market. Everyone talks about the whole of it going up or down. They don't talk about the fact that you can actually buy, you know, you can invest in certain companies, stocks, shares, whatever, and leave it and do better than everything else or do worse than everything else, mm. you know, and I think that that's that nuance and that understanding underneath, you know, lift the bonnet and underneath that, that people just don't want to have when it comes to property. Yeah. And they yeah. don't really want to check their returns, right? So let's say you've mm. already made your investment. That's a good point. You know, yeah. I think mm. a lot of self-managed super fund investors are like this, a lot of property investors, 
they've never actually gone back and look back in time. Well, I bought that in 2007. What were my other prop, the other properties I could have bought in 2007 mm. yeah. and what could my property could be worth today if I bought that. Um, and they've never going back in time. They're just like, well, I bought it now. I'm just going to leave it for 20, 30 years. Oh. And I think share investors are obviously <laughs> the same, you know, I think, um, you know, obviously there's a lot of risk right now with kind of high dividend stocks, for example, you know, and with the franking credits and things like that, you know, they don't really care what it's worth as long as I get my dividends. And, yeah. you know, I think there's just a lot of, uh, you know, not really sound checking or their, their ideas. Yeah. There's, there's, yeah. People don't realize that, you know, they, uh, they'll tell me I bought this property 10 or 15 years ago at X and I've sold it for mm. X. I've done really well. I've doubled oh, my money or yes. you go, hang on, that's sort of three and a half percent per oh, annum. Know. You know, yeah. it's not much more than bank interest. Mm. In fact, bank interest 15 years ago was about seven or eight percent. So you're probably better off in the bank. They see a gain as being, I've done well. And they use that word a lot, that, that phrase, I've and done they, really well in property. And I always say, how have you measured that? And, yeah. yeah, exactly. And, and and a lot of people don't know how to calculate the the return on the, the additional investment that they've made while they've owned the property. You know, it is it is a capital intensive mm. asset, uh, and it requires updating. You know, people, it's amazing. Uh, you know, I've been told by professional property investors, guys who've done very very well um, renovating properties. You know, they can add two or three hundred thousand dollars to a property by just changing the sink and the taps mm. and the door handles, and people will just go, "Oh, I love this property. Mm. You know, this is amazing." You know, and people who buy that property aren't realising that they're going to get a low return out of it yeah. because those taps, you know, that's not enough. Yeah. That's not enough. Yep. The, the value of the property is not what they paid. Mm. So you mentioned something really interesting about the rate of return. I think, you know, people don't understand the cost to buy, the cost to sell, capital gains tax, the holding costs, the repairs. They forget about all these things. Yes. And what they could have Which done with the money. Which is why it's capital intensive. Mm. Yeah, and even just yeah. paying off their mortgage and, you know, other yeah. options and investing. How do you feel like... You know, because there's always an argument with shares and property that you can leverage more into property and leverage is what gives you that return. Of course. Do you, how do you think that really plays out and, and why well, it really affects the property market so much? Many people are going to find out that leverage also bites you in the bum. Can you know? do. And, yeah. and, and, and <laughs> can I say that they've already found that out? Yeah, exactly. And in fact, we're probably closer to the bottom than we've, ever, you know, than we have been in the last couple of years. So, so the answer to the question that I can, I guess my answer to that is, um, I think the access to capital has overinflated, you know, the ease with which people can borrow money to buy property um, has, has caused the overinflation of that as an asset class. Mm. Uh, and people think that it's, you know, it's, it's population growth or it's whatever. Really what's transformed property prices is that back in the seventies, you had to go to the bank with your cap in your, you know, under your arm, mm. begging and pleading for a loan. Mm. And if you got the, the lender on a bad day, you didn't get it. Mm. And what happened since then is, you know, every sort of 25 year old with a Toyota RAV became a bank lender, yep. you know, became mortgage lender. <laughs> and so people now knock on your door and say, do you want the money? And yep. that's what transformed the asset class. The yep. And that's why I said, I keep saying this over and over again, access to Credit and interest rates Absolutely. is is the ultimate driver of of the asset price because and you do and I don't know a lot intimately about um, you know overseas markets but I yes. do know that you can't borrow money as easily in a lot of other markets around the world as That's you can right. here yeah and so therefore you look at America for instance and the and the property market as compared to other asset classes is nowhere near as high you know it's nowhere we, near as large and. Yeah, we saw, we, we saw that, you know, they had a terrible property collapse um, in, not, not in the Great Depression, that was awful, mm. particularly in Florida, um, where people were, had paid ridiculous prices for swamp land, literally swamp land, um, and you couldn't build on it. But, you know, they would sell, they would make a 20% gain in a week mm. back then. And then we had another massive property collapse in, um, in the United States in 2008, 2009. Mm. And to give you some sense of why that was inevitable, they the banks were lending. Um, you know, take I'll give you a case study. One one borrower, uh, a Mexican guy, uh, crossed the border every day to pick strawberries, um, and uh, and he was earning fourteen thousand US dollars a year. The bank a, ba a bank lent him seven hundred thousand dollars to buy a property, mm. on which he would pay no interest and make no repayments for the first three years. And then it would switch to a principal and interest loan mm. and he would have to pay interest at 8%. Yeah. 
he was never going to make the first repayment. Mm. And we could see that was, there was a, what we call um, subprime loan. That was a subprime loan. And that subprime loan, uh, billions and billions and billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars were going to be reset in 2008. So they were going to switch from that non-interest, non-capital repayment period to repayments. And we could see that that was going to, we went to 70% cash at the time in our funds because we saw that was that disaster coming. Wow. But was there's, that there's... The, the Mexican doing that or was the bank speculating? No, it was that... a availability of credit. Yeah. People were knocking on the door and saying, do you want money? You can buy a house. Yeah. I was in Florida. I was driving from South, South Beach to the Florida Keys in December of 2007. So the... The crash hadn't happened yet, uh, and I remember I remember um, seeing a billboard, uh, and it said "Buy one, get one free." It was for a house. <laughs> I kid you not, it was for a house. You could buy a block of land, build a house on it, and they would the developer would subdivide the block of land for you and build a second house for free mm. on that block. And and that was a that was a huge billboard. I took a photograph of it. Mm. It was extraordinary. There's there's a you know a good movie. If you want to watch a movie on that, The Big Short. Oh, I know it well. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Great, great. Explains it. The book is better than the movie. Oh, is it? Yeah. Okay, Yeah, the book great. is much. Read the book. So yeah. I have to yeah. read the book. I've only watched the movie. <laughs> For me, because I couldn't quite wrap my head around it, it was like, oh. And, but funnily enough, I used to always say, well, it won't happen in Australia because our financial situation, <laughs> our financial <laughs> Famous institutions. Famous last words. Yeah, yeah. Are so, you know. This we're, time is different. We're, yeah. No, no, no. We're highly regulated versus that. You know, we, we also got recourse lending. Yes. Which they didn't have. You know, yes, so, but remember, yeah, that's a. That is a fair distinction, but you've got to remember that if you borrow money in the United States, yes, you can leave the keys in the letterbox and walk away, but you'll never borrow money again until you pay that loan off. Mm. So you can't get access to capital if you don't pay off your first loan. Your so credit, your your credit rating's mm. screwed. Yes, you yep. can leave the keys and walk away. No yep. problem. No one's going to chase you, uh, but you won't get another loan. So when you're desperate, you can do it. You can walk away, but, you know. I would hazard a guess that the 14000 a year earning story picker is never going to get another loan anyway. So no, what that's does right. it matter? You that's know? right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Got to and, live in a house for free for three years. And throughout history, look, you know, if I can share this, um, it, hopefully it's useful. Throughout history, you, you get these cycles that mm. emerge through human behaviour where people all believe they're all going to be rich and everyone deserves to be rich and they're all going to. Mm -hmm. And you know when that sentiment has taken hold, it's time to actually get out, yeah. yep. <laughs> not get in. Mm -hmm. um, and, and just, yeah, just remember that for the rest of your life. Uh, and the time to buy is when commercial radio stations, their lead news story is about the collapse in the property market or the collapse in the stock market. Yep. Because by the time it gets onto, you know, Nova or, or you know, a commercial radio station, you know, the... the, mm. the it's Big past. pessimism. It's, 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 it's gone. Yeah, it's yeah. done. Mm. That story is over by the time it's on on the new on that news item, yep. and particularly when it leads the news. Um, yeah, and just remember those two things, and you'll do yep. just fine. <laughs> yeah, because I guess that's when the peak pessimism. That's the least amount of demand. Yeah, and peak optimism on the yeah. other side, which is what we're talking about. You also get you, the best is to strike in the transition of the market. So, so where those poor owners that actually have good quality property and they put it on the market in good faith, thought they were going to get their price. And they get caught out in the vacuum when suddenly the buyers evacuate. And it's yes. like, right, so they're, they're left standing. That's a great time to pick up some great opportunities. Mm. But it doesn't last very long. No. Because then they all they all finally decide to either take their property off the market or they sell. And then what le is left is lower volume, which is what we've got at the moment. Yes. And a lower proportion of good property. And, and the volume is picking up now. Um, that's the first thing. Mm. Um, so there's an interesting dynamic that's happening in Australian property right now. Um, you know, there were only a couple of us who were writing articles in the Australian and the Fin Review saying yep. this is going to end badly. Uh, and now the, we're saying, you know, we're near the bottom. But there's a caveat. Uh, and that caveat is um, that we've seen a, a, there is a huge slowdown coming in construction activity mm. in Australia. Now, why does this matter to anyone? Well, it's because the construction industry is the third largest employer in the country, 9.6% of the workforce, 37% of which is in residential construction. That's 3.5% of the workforce in resi. Now I can tell you house and land package developers and high rise developers, they're busy at the moment, but they're building things that yep. were ordered a year and two years ago. What we now know is that building approvals have fallen about 40% in 
in Australia, mm -hmm. from about 280,000 dwellings to 170,000 dwellings. Now, you can't build anything until you get approval. Mm -hmm. So if if you're getting 40%, if 40% fewer approvals uh, uh, are going through, that's a big slump in construction activity mm -hmm. in the next six to 12 months. And a lot of those haven't been sold, right? Because you know, right. to get approval and to get finance, they might have only sold 30, 40%. Exactly. And then they think, well, that's enough. I can sell the other 70% while I'm building. Yeah. So, so, so that's coming. Uh, that hasn't changed. In fact, I only spoke to a, a builder last week uh, who, who told me that their, their pipeline is down 50% by Christmas and they'll have to lay off staff. Mm -hmm. If And you, you're hearing this secondhand from me, but I heard it from one of the biggest house and land package developers in New South Wales, mm. if not the biggest. Mm. Um, and they'll be down that much. I also know, you know, another anecdote, last year you could not get a bricklayer uh, for love nor money. And if you could, they named their terms and those terms were a dollar eighty to a dollar ninety a brick laid. Yep. Now the the builders are being inundated with brickies looking for work and they're offering to do it for a dollar thirty, dollar forty a brick. Yep. So, you know, that, that dynamic, it, it's happening now. Now, why is that a negative? It's a negative, obviously, because if your third largest employment uh, sector uh, is is going to see 50% less activity or 40% less activity, that produces a negative feedback loop into retailing. They, Nick Scarley is going to sell less furniture. Mm -hmm. Beacon Lighting is going to sell less lighting. JB Hi-Fi, less, less mm -hmm. um, LED TVs. Uh, and, and the... The retail industry is the second largest employer in Australia, the first mm -hmm. being healthcare. And so you got the second and third largest employers in, in Australia um, in combination seeing declining activity. Mm. No wonder the Reserve Bank of Australia wants to cut rates and fast, yep. but they don't want to do it until it's effective. And it won't be effective unless APRA reduces that stressed mortgage test, mm. right, which was 7% and the banks were putting on a 2.25% margin. If that's brought down and the the capital can flow again mm. and credit can flow from the banks, then if the RBA lowers rates, it could have an effect. So I don't know and nobody knows mm. how effective two RBA rate cuts will be at re-stimulating construction activity mm. or demand for house and land packages, which ultimately then will stimulate demand for chippies and tradies. Uh, and then, you know, things are on again and, you know, mm. things stabilise. Um, the government can offer tax cuts. The, you know, for any, if you don't like the Liberal National Party, that's fine, but they are going to have a surplus, a budget mm. surplus, which means they can afford helicopter money. Helicopter money is where you fly mm -hmm. a helicopter over everyone, just yep. throw out the cash. <laughs> we saw that during, well, and we saw mm. it, we saw it here in Australia with the, the school building revolution yeah, yeah, during yeah. the GFC. Yeah. That mm. rescued our economy. Mm. It saved us from a recession. Yep. Well, and they're trying to do that, I guess, with infrastructure, I guess, with, Correct. with low interest rates. It employs and... less people, low infrastructure. Yep. So it won't save mm. the bricklayer because mm. you don't lay bricks when you're building a road. Mm. You know, when you're building the Hume Highway, there's no bricks there's needed. There's only so many jobs they can do anyway, right? Correct. Mm. That's you know, right. We're already building the roads. We're already building the train. Yeah. You know, how much else can we do? So so the, the future of property in the next 12 or 18 months is really dependent on the dynamic between the slowdown in construction activity and whether or not the RBA's ca tax cuts rescue that. Mm. Uh, sorry, not tax cuts, interest rate cuts. Whether the RBA's interest rate cuts rescue the construction sector. And if they do, uh, then we've, we've seen a bottom in property. That's done. If it doesn't, then we might get some forced selling and that forced selling could push property prices down a bit more. Which is interesting, though, because wouldn't you say also that we're going to have a, a shortage of supply and then that will then push prices up? Correct. In three years' time, you'll have a shortage, right? Mm. right? Because the, the, some, of our, some of my friends are some of the biggest property developers in the country. In fact, the biggest privately owned property developer in the country uh, has told me that the problem is councils not approving um, subdivisions and not approving rezonings. Uh, and so that's going to restrict supply mm. in three years' time. Um, so, so that will be fine. Mm. Um, all I'm saying is, yes. you know, whether prices <laughs> fall a little bit further or not, mm. yep. uh, will be dependent on that, that short term dynamic. So those two markets, so the construction industries, you know, there's multiple levels to it, but if we break it down to two, two in particular, the high rise unit market, which yep. is predominantly being bought by investors and investors, a haven't got the borrowing capacity anymore. Sure. B they're scared. 
Um, they're worried that they're not going to get interest only loans just into infinity like they used to. Yep. Um, well, they won't. And, yep. And they've already seen big falls. So the last, they're not confident to go into the market because yes. they've actually figured out high rise apartments aren't good investments. Sure. You've also got safety. You've got Opal Tower and you've got. You know, yeah, the, I think the, that's. That's scaring people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I mean, even it's just the quality of the asset. Mm. Yeah. And, and they can see more cranes coming and they can think more supply has come, which hasn't hit yet. So, we, yes. you know, they're starting to figure it out that maybe property doesn't always go up. So that market, I can't see investors just flooding back in there with their blinkers on, just go, I'm just going to buy. No, I don't. Yeah. So, mm. so we talk sometimes about a V-shaped bottom. Mm. You know, that's where the property, the market falls or the share market falls and then it bounces very, very quickly. I don't think we're going to mm. see any very quick bounce. Yep. Um, you know, it'll be slow and steady and it might accelerate down the track um, if supply is restricted. But remember, by then, we don't know what interest rates are going to mm. be doing. If interest rates are a lot higher, that could slow any kind of recovery as well. Mm. So I just think slow and steady in terms of the, the the recovery that we see this time around, not a not a V-shaped bottom. And we and want that. We really want slow and absolutely. steady. Absolutely. Yeah. But the developers only really make money, like real money, if they're selling it for high prices. So the developers yes. made a lot of money in 16, 15, when they're selling these two bedroom apartments for a million dollars. Yes. But now they can only sell them for say 700 or 750. The profit margin is not there. So they're going, well, I'm not just going to build. Yeah. And so then that's a, going to be inevitable. They're going to have to lay off staff because they're so, not going to build anyway. So they'll, so there'll be some developers that not only lay off staff, but go broke. And so yeah. if you look at tax, um, look at tax office, uh, sorry, ASIC filings in Melbourne, for example, um, we've seen a record number of developers go to the wall and mm. be handed to receivers. Uh, and that's why you're also seeing some of the big property developers like Mervac. Um, uh, I think it's, so it's Featherstone, Featherstone, mm -hmm. it might be Featherstone. No, I don't think it's Featherstone. There's another property developer. They've, they've raised capital recently. Mm -hmm. um, they've been around for a very long time. They know the cycle. Mm. They know that there are property developers who are going to be going to the wall mm. and they're building up their bank account or their war chest, if you like, to, uh, to invest money mm. when everybody else is running for the hills. Mm. Uh, and so <laughs> now is a really good time. So in answer to your question or to, to, to reinforce your point, um, when people are worried and scared, that's the time to be greedy. Mm. Now, yeah. I think Warren Buffett said, yeah. I think it was Warren Buffett who said, be greedy when yeah, everyone else is fearful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Be fearful when everyone else is greedy. Yeah. But yeah. be greedy with the right assets. So I wouldn't be greedy going yeah, to buy so, these kind of high rise apartments. No, buy anything, you know, buy oh, the no, stuff no. that's, you know, valuable. There's actually, a, mm. you know, good assets. I mean, the house and land package is the other side. I mean, first home buyers, I think they're also understanding that, these house and land packages aren't just great investments. You can't just go and buy greenfield new houses and then yes. And so, you know, if you you got to stimulate either the investors or the first home buyers, and the first home buyers go, well, that new estate that was nine hundred thousand is only seven hundred now. Mm. I might as well just buy one of those. I don't need to buy a new house well, and land package. Well, it's because yeah, what you're talking about is the fungibility of property, which mm. is a word not many people fungibility. have. Fungibility. Fungibility. <laughs> it's it's transferable. Um, mm. uh, if I can't afford that house. And that apartment has fallen forty percent. Well, I'll buy the apartment, mm. okay? Because they're 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 fungible. I, they 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 they're valued the same to me. Mm. I can not for everybody, but to the extent that they're fungible, that influences the prices of all property. And so, if a house hasn't fallen in price, and people often ask me, Rog, what you're talking about, I, I think you're right on on um, apartments, but I don't think you're right on freestanding houses. Mm. But if fewer people turn up to the auction for the house because they've all gone and bought the apartment because the apartment's fallen 30 or 40%, yep. then there's less, the house has to come down. Yep. And so, you know, it's that old, um, you know, Chinese proverb, I guess, you drop a pebble in a pond and eventually the ripples affect the entire pond. And that's so what's, what's happened mm. a lot is that, you know, those areas, well, I don't need to buy a house and land package because it's 50, 60 Ks. I've still got a million dollars borrowing capacity, but I can actually buy 15 Ks closer to the city now. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, it drags the buyers, you know, the ripple the effect. reverse ripple effect. Yeah, yeah. it goes back yeah. into the city. <laughs> yeah. When I'm talking about the ripple effect, I just mean that you can't have, um, you can't have one style of property doing well and it not, or doing badly and it not having some influence on other properties mm. because of that fungibility. Well, that's what Frank Gilbert talked about back in, I can't even remember what episode, it was in the 30s anyway. Yeah, yeah right. So he's a, you know, he's been a, a property forecaster. What He calls himself a um, property forecaster with a long memory because he's been yes. doing it for 37 years or something. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, enough. he talks about that as well. Now, we're, unfortunately, we've run out of time. I reckon we could okay. sort of get another hour out of this. This is really interesting <laughs> stuff. Um, 
I really appreciate, well, we both really appreciate you coming and talking to us because the thing is that property, you know, this either or mentality of money market or equities versus property, I think it's all interrelated in many respects because as you even talked about with the construction industry and we're, we're, we're very bearish when it comes to new property in terms mm. of buying as investment, but the reality is it's all part of one whole market, isn't it? And Indeed. everything is inter- interlinked and everything is, uh, there's a causal effects that happen you know, interest rates fall and, and the whole rollout of that. So I think this has been a really interesting chat to start to show, shed some light on some of those aspects. And I really appreciate your insights. Thank you. Nice to be with you. Thanks and just, for inviting me. I just want to throw in one quick question and we'll just drag it in there as well. Sure. We, when you spoke about um, the RBA and rate cuts, yes, um, you we didn't actually say whether, what you thought whether it would have been enough. So, you know, yeah. if RBA do cut rates by half a percent and maybe even a percent, do you actually think that that will have a huge impact in the psychology of the market and bring a lot of more buyers into the market? Or do you think that they'll have to do a lot more than that? Look, uh, the, the truth is I don't know. Um, and the great thing about investing successfully is you don't need to know. Mm. If you have your anchor as value uh, and you think about, always think about quality. So when we've been talking about blood in the streets or, you know, the radio, you know, the, the lead article on the news mm. being property prices falling, Always remember the framework that you need is, is this a quality asset first? Mm-hmm. And quality doesn't mean you think it's going to go up. Yep. It's fundamentally got to be, is it quality if it never goes up again? Is it quality? And and that's separate to the value question. And if you've got those two things, we don't need to forecast whether or not the RBA is successful or not, yep. because that's related to price, not so much value. Mm-hmm. As long as we've got that quality and value anchor, we'll be able to respond if, if it is effective or ineffective, mm-hmm. either way, we'll know what to do. Yeah. And no matter what happens long-term, if it's a quality asset and it's scarce or it's a great company and it's producing great profits, Look, it if will you're survive. In your, uh, let me assure everyone who's listening, if you're in your 20s, you will be 60 one day and that <laughs> is 40 years from now. Mm. And I can almost guarantee it's a, a lot lower risk. Uh, in fact, I will guarantee that property prices will be higher mm. uh, in 40 years' time than mm-hmm. they are today, particularly in, in inner city areas where you know there's a, there's a, there's restrictions on over, there will be restrictions on overdevelopment. Um, I can also tell you bank shares will be a lot higher than they are today yep. too, because they'll be lending a lot more money to facilitate that property boom. <laughs> That's such common sense. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Roger. Cheers. No problem. Every week you hear incredible stories of the dumb things property buyers do. Dumb things that end up costing a whole lot of money and or creating a whole lot of stress. Mistakes that can be avoided. Now, Roger didn't have a dumbo for us because he's an equities guy. But Veronica, you've got one for us, haven't you? Oh, I do. I do. In fact, this is um, fairly recent. People will talk about, you know, buying property and they're always looking for good opportunities and bargains, particularly in a buyer's market. But what leads to a bargain or what what gives a bargain or the opportunity of a bargain. And quite often it's because the property itself is not so great. But we recently bought a property, I believe, for a bargain. It was a great property for a client. And the reason we got it was because the owner, the person selling that property, had bought another property before they sold. And that in itself is not the dumb thing, but they hadn't organised bridging finance As it turned out, they're on the cusp of retirement and couldn't get bridging finance. They'd bought with a three-month settlement um, and they just assumed that every buyer was going to be able to settle on their property within six weeks. So they got to a couple of days before their auction and it was, there was a lot of people on this. It should have been a really competitive auction, a good, you know, a good auction um, from their point of view, but they're a couple of days out and I think they finally fessed up to their agent, the situation, the predicament they were in. They had pretty much every buyer asking for a 12 week settlement because every, all their buyers needed to sell something. And we just saw the opportunity to buy that property at a lot less money, purely because my client could actually do a six week settlement where most other people couldn't. So that bargain didn't come about because of the market. It came about because those owners had got themselves into a situation that really was avoidable. Um, They also hadn't actually got advice from the people that were working for them, probably their broker, or if they had a broker, um, certainly not their, their agent. They certainly didn't seek 
um, from the vendors to whether they could extend on those 12 weeks. They left everything to the last minute and then they were backed into a corner. So that's my property Dumbo this week. We want to make you a better elephant rider. And this week's elephant rider training is... We want to look at the uh, concept of value investing and how it implies to property. I mean, we did talk about this quite a bit uh, in this interview with Roger. And and he talked about value being what fundamentally something's actually worth versus what you pay for it. And now, certainly when people are focusing on the property market, they're often talking about, I did well because I bought at a cheap price. Or I did well because I screwed a deal or it was a buyer's market or prices are falling and so therefore I did well. But they're not sort of focusing so much on the actual calibre of the asset. So, And that was something that came through loud and clear in this conversation with Roger. Now, the the calibre of the asset is so important in property because really it's the icing on the cake. So many experts talk about location being the only thing you need to worry about. And it's very, very important. I mean, it's 80-20 rule, basically 80% of it is location. However, what is really going to make the difference over time for a property investor is understanding the calibre of that asset within a location. And I'll just give you an example. You could buy say two, two apartments in one suburb. There are some suburbs that might have smaller blocks on bigger blocks of land. They're older, they're well built, they're owned predominantly by owner occupiers. There's a lot of pride in the building and they're scarce because there might only be six or eight or nine in the actual block. Now, in the very same suburb, you might have a high rise and that is, you know, 20 stories for argument's sake, lots and lots of apartments, all exactly the same. And some people think, oh, I'll go for new because it's brand new and, you know, you get to enjoy all of that, whereas the older one may not have a new kitchen and bathroom in it. But fundamentally, what are you buying? You know, you're buying a piece of land, you know, a, a part of or, or a percentage of your ownership is, the, is part of that land that the property sits on. You're buying a scarce asset or you're buying something that's lots of them. Uh, you're buying something in a location in the part of that suburb that is more established, that is closer to all the amenities and all that sort of thing, or you're buying one that's maybe further out that doesn't have those things. So it's really important to think long term, what is going to hold its value and be more appealing to future buyers than today? Because that is essentially what you're buying. You're looking at buying that quality of asset that long term is going to be more appealing and have more buyers on it than another property that will have less buyers on it. So that's sort of, it's a fairly simple way of explaining it, I think. But that's the thing that when you're looking at property in terms of looking at value, that's the thing that you really need to be focusing on. Join us for our next episode when we interview a lot in this episode and we hope you can join us don't forget we're on all the social channels we're on facebook we're on linkedin we're on twitter or you can connect with us on the elephant in the the links are all there for you please connect and send us a message we'd love to hear from you the elephant in the room property podcast is recorded at the sydney sound brewery this week's podcast was recorded by john risk editorial by gordy fletcher until next week don't be a dumbo Now remember, everything we talked about on this podcast is general in nature and should never be considered to be personal financial advice. If you're looking to get advice, please seek the help of a licensed financial advisor or buyer's agent who will tailor and document their advice to your personal circumstances with a statement of advice.